the one that you're going to shoot the most often, the one that's not going to labor your wallet um, or labor your wrist into failure is the one you're going to be best with. Likelihood of being able to see your sights in the first place while doing this, pretty slim. Personal theory is I'd rather have more that I can hit with that'll take a, a, a step back in, in power and energy than have less that I will struggle to impact target with. What is up, everybody? Welcome to Cartridge Talks, fully loaded, 9mm versus 10mm, best for bear defense. Uh, Mark and Ryan here for the uh, cartridge breakdown, as per usual. Ryan, we uh, we did a fair amount of shooting the other day. This is the most pistol shooting I've done in a while. So, uh, and, and we, broke, we broke this down in the video, but we'll talk about, uh, let's talk about the tools we were using. Mm-hmm. Uh, Smith & Wesson M&P 2.0s. In fact. 1 in 9, 1 in 10. Uh, Buffalo Bore Outdoorsman uh, hardcast ammunition. Uh, when we were uh, using our holsters. Yep. Uh, Rasco uh, hip belt holsters mounted to the, I guess, you know, the, the hip belt of, of our Stone Glacier backpacks. Yep. And, uh, oh, gosh, the, maybe possibly the piece stage. Resistance, a def- Defender ST red dots. We, tied, on we top. tied it back to optics on our podcast, Mark. We did it. My we gosh. did it. Uh, I really liked the system that we used. I was impressed. Uh, one thing I, I want to start with here, we're saying 9 versus 10, best for bear defense. Now, I don't want to be, uh, I guess, maybe contrary, but at the end, at the end of the day, in some ways, Neither, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Prefer- and, preferably 300 Win Mag, 338 Win Mag, 375 H&H, 416 Remington. Right. Sure. We're not, uh, it's it's not like I'm like, I'm going to go hunt brown bears. I'm like. I'm packing my pistol. I'm packing my pistol. No, probably not. Like you're saying, this is this is defense. This is, you know, uh, hopefully a last resort. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, a situation that, that to some degree has gone south. And you're at the point where you're using your pistol, you know, to to defend your life or yeah. the lives of of uh, people around you. Yeah, I'm just gonna say this. This is my favorite one that we've done. It's pretty cool. I, I think because we got a chance to go outside of the normal boundaries of operation that we've normally done. We we brought a, a really cool prop to the scene. Yes. So yeah, well, let's mention the props that we use. So we used our typical. Uh, forty-inch gel yep. blocks. Yep. Uh, blocks is uh, actually most appropriate for this one because ultimately we needed two to to capture these uh, pistol projectiles. Uh, something that I was uh, surprised by. And then if you're watching on YouTube, which I would suggest, watch this one on YouTube. Yeah. This is Yeah, we've got some uh, like some extra stuff here. If you've watched the cartridge talks video too, if you've seen all of this stuff before, uh, we have a. We have and shot into, well, several, but uh, on the table right here, a representation of a Boone and Crockett scaled brown bear. Mortifying. Just looking at, which you might not be able to see on YouTube. Oh, Ryan's got, oh, he's got cameras everywhere. He's got cameras everywhere. Uh, The vertebrae even in the, like the skull is menacing. The vertebrae are almost like equally menacing when you just like look at the scale of this thing. Mark made a comment. I, I don't think it's on camera, but when we walked into the range, actually the day before the shoot, so we're getting set up and get everything going. He goes, that thing's a dinosaur. Um, and th- that it, it evoked something in me, like this vestigial leftover. I was going to say, this thing's a leftover. From, you know, some ice age period in which you just had to be this massive creature to eke out an existence um before us a skull yeah now um brown bears grizzly bears come in all shapes and sizes right some big some small i'd say like your your inland grizzlies are going to be you know quite a bit smaller than like uh like a big coastal coastal brown bear which is probably what this is representing here but sure our uh you know for our intents and purposes of uh, 
you know, trying to sort out the answer to this question to the best of our ability. Yeah. And I'll, I'll, I'll uh, also repeat, this is a representation, right? Yeah. I think you mentioned something to the effect of, you know, we didn't have any uh, real life charging brown bears on tap. Correct. Uh, but hopefully to a high level, fairly accurate. Um, you know what? It, it, we'll get into this a little bit. Um, you know, one of the, one of the things that kind of downplays the effectiveness of any ballistics gelatin test is that we don't have varying tissue density and we don't have bone and we don't have, you know, musculature and we don't have organ tissue and all these things. And so anytime you can introduce some sort of, of uh, variable to the gel to r- represent firing into something like a bear, for instance, mm-hmm. y- you find some fascinating results. And boy, did we. Yeah. Boy, did we. We sure did. Um, and, you know, also, Ryan, the uh, the gel in the uh, the bear head skull vertebrae representation uh, is a little bit different. It is, than yeah. Than the typical gel that we shoot projectiles into. This we have is, both on, you know, in front of us right here. This is the stuff that's made out of um, animal product. It has an odor. Yeah. From a distance, it's kind of like beef jerky. Up close, it's not. I find it to be a little tart. It, it is now. I think it's souring a bit. Um, there will be flies. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, a really cool, really cool medium to fire into. Very, uh, very interesting test for us. Um, let's talk uh, a little bit about the cartridges themselves sure. here, Ryan. Sure. Um, like I said, uh, I mean, it says strictly business right on the box. Uh, they mean it, too. Um Set up for uh, Buffalo Bore. Uh, the 10 millimeter, this is, you know, hard cast, is a 220 grainer, leaving the muzzle at 1,200 feet per second. That's, that means business. Uh, 703 foot pounds at the muzzle. Chunky. Right? That's a lot. It's a hefty load. I'd say, you know, for a 10 millimeter load, that is a big, heavy projectile. Going fast, right? I'm doing research while you're talking. Okay, do the research. Yep. Uh, in contrast, we have a 9mm plus P outdoorsman. This is a 147 grainer, leaving the muzzle at 1,100 feet per second. Also hot for caliber. Also hot for caliber. I'd say also a larger projectile for caliber, um, or heavier, I should say. Uh, 395 foot-pounds of energy at the <clears throat> muzzle. So no uh, slouch, you know, uh, 1200 feet per second with the 10, 1100 with the nine. Uh, but that energy differential is stark, stark to put a little, um, which is again, 703 versus 395. Yeah. To put a little context on the table. I think a lot of people, myself included, um, often when we're, we're looking at like, okay, what's a good bear pistol cartridge. Mm Mm-hmm. We think about forty-four Remington Magnum, mm-hmm. and it is right. That that's pr- that's pretty common. First time I ever went into uh, grizzly bear country was Montana. I fished. I fished a lot in Alaska as a kid. Yep. And, uh, and I guess I've done so, you know, uh, in my adult life as well. Yeah. But I mean, like everybody that had a pistol carried a forty-four. Sure. So looking, uh, looking at some 44 Remmeg data, we'll, we'll use this as a benchmark that we're not necessarily assigning any points to or anything like that. Um, 240 grain, 4, 0.429 diameter bullet at 1235. So this is a Remington 240 JHP, pretty standard load. Okay. And they make them hotter, like you can get hotter. Yeah, like you could get something like this in a yeah. 44. But a, a pretty standard 44 Remmeg. Uh, 20 grains of, of mass, slightly larger diameter, uh, picking up about 35 feet per second. That's not insignificant. And I guess why I'm, I'm making the statement is that that Buffalo Bore 10 is knocking on the door of 44 Rem Mag. Of like a standard yeah. 44. Yeah. Um, I'll also say our, our reasoning mm-hmm. behind uh, comparing these calibers for, or these, you know, calibers, cartridges, for this application is at least to me 
it seems to be the trend yeah. for what people are carrying into Big Bear country these uh, days. And I think there's some sound logic in that. Um, people are like, getting away from the wheel gun. Yeah. Not everybody. No. And I'm not saying you should either. There's still a very viable solution for this application. So here's the hypothesis. Let's say you had yourself a, I'll pick on the Smith & Wesson 329 PD, because we talked about that a couple dozen podcasts ago, is viable bear defense. So um, the 329 PD is a uh, lightweight frame, 44 mag, and it's a handful. It's a large gun in in stature, and then of, of course in caliber. Its weight makes it nearly unmanageable, nearly. Um, you can get good with it if you if you give it some diligent practice, but you have six rounds on tap. And when you start reducing the weight, and we look at the mechanism in, in like a wheel gun, you know, there's there's no reciprocating slide or recoil spring to absorb any recoil. Like you're taking the full brunt of that gun. Yeah. And maybe you don't carry a 329 PD. Maybe you carry a, a you know a 629, um, and you get a full full steel gun or or something of the sort. But you have six rounds on tap, and you have a lot of recoil, which means that your first round ought to be good because the subsequent rounds, you're going to be lifted off target every time you yank that trigger, and and your hit probability is likely to go down. Now, I'm still looking for a 629 PD, or, <laughs> or, or excuse me, 329 PD, to put that theory to the test. I don't think I'm going to shoot it very well. Um, and so why the auto pistol? Well... Um, recoil mitigation, um, increased round count, mm -hmm. and increased hit probability. So the question to ask yourselves, is it better to have 13 in a magazine that you have an increased hit probability but a lower power factor on target than six in the cylinder um, with a remarkably decreased hit probability with higher power factor? And that's um, per perhaps an unanswerable. I, I think my personal theory is I'd rather have more that I can hit with um, that'll take a, a, a step back in, in power and energy than have less that I will struggle to impact target with. I've never been in this situation in real life, though. Yeah. This is the closest I've come. I've never... I've been around... Mm -hmm brown bears before yep uh i don't think i've ever been around a grizzly actually um i've been very close to them yeah i've been in one scenario where i thought we might have to shoot a bear yep um alaska alaska yeah. was not uh <clears throat> i've told this story before so if you've heard it forgive me but it's probably it's pertinent to this conversation i, I thought it's actually an interesting the bear's reaction, I thought, was interesting. Okay. Uh, we were hunting black bears in, in southeast Alaska in an area that we had intel from a former guide. This is many years ago. This is probably like 2004. So a lot of oh, years, yeah. A lot Mark, of years ago. I was, I was a sophomore Just in high school. Just a pup. Yeah. Uh, and it's supposed to be only black bears in the area. It's our first day of hunting. We found a uh, kind of like an abandoned logging road system. Sure. Took the, we uh, ferried to this island uh, via a boat. We had shipped up a 10 foot four inflatable with an outboard, and that was going to be kind of like our mode of transportation. Not, not a big boat, not a lot of range, right? Sure. Uh, we tested that range. Nearly died in the channel. Uh, anyway, that's a story for itself. I'm riveted. Like I said, it's the first day of the hunt. I'm looking like up this road system. It's got some beautiful, just like emerald green grass on it. Through the timber, I can I see legs coming down the road. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is day one. Home run. Like we're seeing bears already. Comes around the corner, and I'm like, got my binos binos on. I'm like, huh? Gets a little closer, and I'm like, dude, this is a brown bear. Like this is <coughs> this is definitely a brown bear. Gets to about. I want to say 60 yards. Uh, my dad was actually on the, my buddy and I were kind of like on this uh, rock bluff where they kind of carved out the road through the rock. Bear gets to approximately 60 yards 
you know, thereabouts, going off memory here. My, my dad was on the level of the bear, like ground level of the road, taking some pictures. You know, um, we all have guns, right? We're not like, you know, we're obviously, you know, aware that, that a bear is there. My, uh, my buddy goes to open a dry bag to get to his camera. It, was, it had a Velcro closure on it. I was thinking, oh, certainly this will spook the bear. and He's going to be out of there. But it's cool. We got to see him. We've taken some pictures. He opens that thing. The bear does not skip a beat. He drops his head, drops into a trot directly at us. and covers ground fairly quickly. I will add, this is not a big bear. Sure. It's a young male, uh, I think, uh, freshly kicked off of mom. Okay. Like, not, not, not a big bear like at all. Does that be like a two-year-old bear? Like, maybe. Okay. You know, um, I don't know. Like, even... Put, I think that was the case, but potentially maybe even an, an orphaned young male oh, or something. Really? You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't know what the case was. It wasn't a cub, you know, it was, anyway, uh, drops and trot directly at us. My buddy Todd and I stand up with our rifles, start yelling at the bear, some, some obscenities, telling it to leave, uh, making ourselves look big, you know, just, yeah, get out of here, get out of here, you know, in different words. Uh, the bear just stands there at like 20 yards. Okay. Does not leave, does not turn tail, just stands there with its beady little eyes staring at us. You know, and luckily he's like looking at us. Because like I said, my dad is on the same level as the bear. Uh, but also potentially, like if the bear did spook, he's got, you know, what's his egress going to be? Sure. Um, so anyway, yeah. I mean, we're rifles up, yelling at this bear. Eventually... It slowly, it's like, eh. It slowly walks down the road, gets around the corner. My dad gets up to where we are, and I'm like, oh man, that was pretty wild. Like that thing was just like not. I'd, I'd also say nearly certain, like we were the first humans he'd ever seen. Could be at least been close to, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, we kind of like, you know, gather ourselves, wait up there a little bit, go back down kind of peeked down the road where the bear went that sucker was looking back at me he had just gone far enough to kind of get out of sight and we were like looking peering almost like peering around the bend of the road at each other and i'm like dude this guy is like still thinks there's an opportunity here yeah like i'm i think i could still eat these guys i mean not like you know Oof. i'm that's my interpretation i'm not you know in the mind of of a bear exactly but that was my that's my like i said i've been around a fair amount of brown bears. Um, but that was kind of like my knock on wood, one encounter where I had a bear, you know, quotation mark, charge. I, I think he heard that sound was like, whatever that is, I think I can eat that. You know what I mean? Um, did you have a pistol? I did not. I just had my rifle. 300 wisdom? Yes. It would have done the job. Right. You know, we had three, you know, essentially three 300s. My dad might actually have had a, a 338. I can't remember. But... Um, you know, 20 yards, scoped rifle, like had it wanted to make a move in a direction that we didn't want it to go, you know, we would have had some pretty serious medicine for it. And we were ready, right? Yeah. That was a situation where we saw the bear beforehand, very aware of its presence. Like I said, heck, we're taking pictures, right? Uh, you know, and then kind of when it started not acting, I guess how you'd hope a bear may act in a situation like that, you know, rifles up and prepared to, you know, Rock and roll. Rock and roll. You yeah. know, depending on 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 what transpired next. So that's that's my that was my one situation. I've never had that. I hope you don't. That's the goal, right? Yeah. I don't really want to wax one if I don't have to. No, no. I mean, that's you know, and that's cross. You're like, oh my gosh, are we gonna have to shoot this bear? Then what? Like, what you know? What's that look like? Um, I think it's a mess, isn't it? I think yeah. I think you. It's not. It's something you want to avoid. Like I said, I've never personally had to do it. Don't want to have to do it. Uh, but also, when you go into bear country, be prepared. Be prepared. Yeah. So that's what brought us here, Mark. Yeah. So we selected these auto pistols, commonly found mm -hmm. in, in, I think, a cartridge that is very in vogue for bear defense. The, the you, you hear a lot of folks... Yeah. I'm, I'm I'm bow hunting elk in in Grizz country. Ten millimeter. I'm gonna I'm getting a ten. 
And then a cartridge that is perhaps the most popular self-defense cartridge um, for like concealed carry that might not be a commonly selected bear cartridge. Right. Uh, the 9 millimeter. Yes. But there was there was rhyme to our reason. Or there, reason to our rhyme? Well, there's reason. But I'd say, let's, I'll say both. Yeah. Um, you know, the 9 millimeter, we talked a little bit about in this video, uh, with this loading, is what I carried in Alaska a couple years ago now. Uh, without kind of the data that we have now. I was like, hey, this is the pistol that I have. It's the pistol that I'm personally most comfortable with. Um, I didn't really feel like buying a new pistol before the trip. I understand. You know, uh, you, know you might say, well, isn't your life worth... Yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's what I had, and that's what I went with. And uh, But like I said, I didn't have the... Uh, I left with a few question marks. Sure. Am I being irresponsible? Man, everybody seems like they're getting a 10 these days. Should I get a 10? I should probably get a 10. This is what I have. Ultimately, I went with the 9. Yeah. So let's, um, let's talk about it. Should we talk about the tests? You didn't see the video? So, yeah, we did a series of... Uh, we should have brought one of the paper targets. Yeah. It's paper. It's boring. It was me. Yeah. Uh, there was a boar on the paper. A boar, picture of a boar grizzly. Yeah. Um, we did a series of paper target tests. Uh, the first test was like a static shoot for accuracy yep. at your own pace, you know, to the best of your ability, like how well can you shoot this pistol? Now, I will say I took a lot of time to do that. You took a lot less time to do that. I think you treated it more as like a uh, how best can I shoot this pistol at a cadence that I might... Control, but with a little bit of haste. Control, yeah, controlled yeah. haste, and I was like, a lot more deliberate. My personal objective was to kind of um, evaluate, like I've done a lot of shooting with 9mm. Mm -hmm. I've done a fair amount of shooting with 10mm, but not not even not even close to the amount that I have with 9. And so I'm familiar with 9, light loads, standard loads, heavy loads. Um, and I, I just wanted to say like, okay, is the 10, knowing that we are definitely picking up some horsepower, is it undue? And how fast can I drive it accurately? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, subjectively, it's probably double the recoil. It feels like that in the hand. Mm -hmm. it, it, you know when you touch that gun off. Um, but it wasn't to the point where it's like, nope, I have no control. Right. We, we, we shot them. I think we both shot them very well. Um, there's some interesting things with, with the 9B10, how it played out on paper. And I have some working theories. But as Mark said... Paper tests, baseline of accuracy, we incorporated some movement, we incorporated target movement, we incorporated some some um, challenges for us physically. We ladened ourselves with about 50 pounds total. Yep. Uh, 40 pound salt bag. Plus you know, pack. And plus pack. Goodies. Approximately, we'll say a 10 pound rifle. Yep. Um, which, for me, that's like how I had that set up was essentially how I was carrying... That was my system. Yep. That's how I was carrying my rifle on, on Kodiak. That's how I was carrying my pistol. Um, and I often had, we'll say, you know, probably 25 or, you know, when we're packing deer out, I probably had. Well, if you're going to pull a whole blacktail off the mountain, you'd probably be at about that weight. Probably a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you're pulling like a head and a cape off plus, plus change, I mean, what's a blacktail weigh? Buck 50? Yeah, I, I bet the deer that I shot at least weighed, you know, buck fifty on yeah. the hoof. It was so, a really large. I think the blacktails there are, you know, when you think of like uh, the spectrum of Sitka blacktails. Yeah, they're they're big body deer. Sure. The whole the whole premise of of the pack on there was to, like, and I fall victim of this myself. Criticisms of it. It's like you sit on a flat range and you draw from a holster and you're in as controlled an environment as possible. You can do some pretty incredible trick shooting. You make it look good. You can make it look smooth. I'll tell you what, things I've never done is put 50 pounds on my back, took off at a standard walking pace, turned 180 degrees or 90, I suppose, but my gun, 180 degrees, I turned 90 and shot at a charging target. And granted, it wasn't the speed that a bear's charging at, but it was no. a moving target. Um, that 
it upsets well, it you. It created like, a sense of urgency. It did. Right? And you were wanting to get, we, we were also doing, you know, I guess, you know, five round. Yep. Bursts. Bursts, yeah. if you will. It, um, um, it, it, like you're moving when you don't want to be and mm-hmm. you're trying to compensate for that. And so that was pretty cool. It was, it was an interesting test. Um, and then on top of that, you're, you're managing the gun at the same time. Mm-hmm. We did have um, the new Defender STs on both of these pistols. And for me, this was uh, an, a, especially a challenge because I'm not a good red dot shooter. I've shot irons forever. and Well, so ingrained into what you've done for so long. Yeah. And so it was, um, it was interesting for me to have to kind of do that live and just kind of see where I ended up. Learned a lot. Uh, in in the seconds between seconds, when you have five rounds and you have about three seconds to turn, pivot, fire, um, learn a lot. Yeah, it was, it was good. What I found with having and I, and I think you know having the pack on really added to you know our testing uh, added weight physically, but like you know pretty accurate simulation of what your load might be going in. Like if you're going on like a you know a multi-day. A multi-day hunt, uh, solid simulation of of packing out like you know uh, the hind of a deer or uh, maybe you got two fronts or you know what have you. But it was a nice like I I'd say like was it the heaviest that you would ever have on your back? No, but it was like a nice like I'd say middle ground of of what that would could potentially feel like. Um, it definitely affected you know we had some simulations where or. Uh, like you had to maybe like turn, pivot, draw, maybe you're walking and you have to stop. That weight, you know, definitely changes things a little bit. Big time. Uh, you know, and it changes how, how your feet can move. Um, I don't know. Like that was. It was good. If anybody is like, you know, kind of going through this similar process as we are, uh, I would suggest doing that. I would suggest yep. practicing like yep. that. Yep. I agree. Um, and then just holster management in general, too. There's a lot of different ways you can carry a pistol. Um, you know, you can carry it on a chest rig. You can carry, carry it cross draw under the arm. You can carry it on a hip belt. You can carry appendix. Like when, when I'm hunting, like Taylor and I did an archery pronghorn hunt. We were in South Dakota. Um, I carried my pistol up front appendix like I normally do every day. Um, really? Every day. Yep. Wow. We, we walked 35 miles. and Even with your? Yeah. Huh. And it is, it's, it's manageable, um, but, you know, it was a hot weather hunt. It was 97 degrees, so we're wearing like a single, you know, thin layer of merino, you know, long sleeve hoodie kind of thing, and that wasn't that big a deal. I, cu- I couldn't carry that pistol if I was wearing in that fashion or form anyway um, under any kind of other outerwear. Like, gotcha. it, just, it just wouldn't wouldn't work. Um, so when we were looking at this, we thought, oh, do we, you know, do we put them in like a Rasco under harness holster? Um, or we put them on the hip belt. I'm a big proponent of the hip belt for a number of different reasons. Um, I think just drawing from one of those those holsters in the environment that we were in, I, d- I didn't love the idea of that because the gun's going to be perpendicular to the line of fire. We're going to be drawn. I don't want to point a gun at my arm kind of thing. And that hip belt holster that they have, though, is very natural. It's very normal. The way that it secures is pretty clever. And then if you're really clever with... The attachment methods, what I would personally do moving forward is I'd put a Safari Land QLS system on the back of that Rasco. Oh. And then I would have a Safari Land QLS on my regular belt, like I wear around my, my pants, so that if I dismount my pack, I can just put my holster right on my pack. Yeah. I wouldn't always have my bino harness on, like in camp maybe. This is all I'm working on theory. Um, I could always have that pistol on me. And it's a position that I really am quite familiar with, as opposed to relocating it to under my vinyl harness, which actually doesn't work for me anyway. So I thought it was, I thought it was keen, pretty keen how we did that. Um, so yeah, paper test. We also shot Jello. We did. Yep. Can I say, I'm going to say one more thing about the, it was such a secure, like I like the security of where the pistol sat. Mm-hmm. Uh, I liked that it was a little bit further back. It was never in my way, but it was always close enough that, that I had it at the ready. Um, and like the drop, like it was just the re- the um, I guess resistance, yeah. right? It was just like like it, 
Yep. I thought it just, I thought it just worked really Yeah, well. if you were going to be, you know, running around, trekking poles on, or if, even if you had your rifle slung, I mean, it, in no way, shape, or form was where your pistol mm-hmm. was going to inhibit your regular range of motion. I will say from, uh, and I saw that you and I did this a little bit differently, Yeah. Uh, but like when, so when I have that system in place with the pistol on my right, yeah. I put the, my rifle on the left side of my pack, which I might, if I wasn't carrying a pistol, I might. You know, keep, I've done both, I guess, in the sure. past. But when I have the pistol, I put the rifle on the left side of my pack. Yeah, and uh, the only reason I think I had mine on there is I run that FHF rifle sling system. Right. So, uh, t- like, typically speaking, I'm clipped on to that unit. My tripod spotter is going to be on the left side. Mm-hmm. I try to balance my, my pack out as best I can. Um, and because I'm right-handed, my, my gun's always on my strong side. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. pistol, rifle, otherwise. Uh, and that that's how I would in the field run with that otherwise uh which is is fine and it, again it didn't it didn't inhibit or hinder me in any way shape it or didn't, form no not at all um and I would have had um that that system comes with a a kind of a, a harness if you will for the butt stock of the rifle I didn't have it attached to my pack I had the little loop around the wrist of the stock mm-hmm. I would have probably had the the harness attachment to it as well just didn't in this case which is fine uh but i thought that was a very clever way to, to carry and and would recommend doing that i'd i'd one up on that and i'd add a safariland qls attachment so that i could take the pistol off the pack put the pistol on the belt and just kind of yep. no matter what you're like oh i've got an animal down i yep. have my pack off I'm gonna, i still want my pistol on my person while i work up this animal um things like that i'll say so one thing that i <clears throat> was surprising to me but also we have some theories around it i'd say ultimately so i'll I'll speak to myself and then maybe you can to you we do all the paper shooting yeah i'd say i shot the nine and the ten about the same sure um which i thought i would shoot the nine a lot better uh you brought up a couple things that i do think make sense here um Again, some of these are like working working theories as we think through this. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we were shooting the nine first. Yep. In these, you know, drills, if you will. Yep. Okay. Well, you've had a you've you've had a a run through, and and you even you know spoke to like you know competitive shooting and things like that. You know, maybe maybe talk about like when you had a run through. Oh yeah. <clears throat> so i will say on uh, on average or in general through this exercise i actually shot the 10 better which flies in the face of of logic and reason because the gun is definitely harder to drive i i want to make no um i want to make no misconception about that that gun is harder to shoot by a, a margin um it has way more recoil it's way more disruptive and it should be it's a 10 millimeter firing a 220 grain projectile 1200 feet per second nearly double uh the muzzle energy of the nine millimeter but as mark said because we got to shoot the drill first with nine you kind of figured out what you needed to do mark also made a really good point that you you're there's an anticipation that that 10 is not as pleasant to shoot you are gripping and ripping and instead of like relaxed and almost lackadaisical with the nine millimeter, because well, it's a nine millimeter, you got a little sloppy. I did. I know I did. I think maybe I did yep. as well. Here's what I know about the difference. I was always more cognizant of being like, I need to hold on to this thing. Yeah. Right. And, and that's that's a very real thing. Which, and I'll say this also, in the minimal pistol shooting that I've done throughout my shooting career like if i was going to pick something i've done the least of it's going to be pistol by far sure um i think that's probably one of the things that i need to work on most sure is that grip pressure and i know although the nine or excuse me although the 10 recoils a lot more i was always more cognizant of having more grip pressure yeah um when i used to shoot a lot of three gun and uspsa if i ever had a reshoot on a stage like there's like a prop failure or something went i always did better unless i lost my mind 
unless I got cocky and was like, oh yeah, I'm going to burn this reshoot down. Um, but yeah, anytime you get a, a second crack at a simulation or a situation, usually you're going to do better. And I, I think that's why I did shoot the 10 better. It was a harder gun to shoot for sure. And I think if I were to execute these processes multiple times, if I was going to have 10 runs with a nine millimeter, 10 runs with a 10 millimeter, I think at the end of it, I'd probably shoot better with the nine because mm-hmm. it was an easier gun to control. It was a faster gun to shoot. The splits and the times overall favored the nine. The accuracy didn't. Um, I think that the, the nine would end up on top for me. Yeah. And I think we, interestingly enough, we both lean that way, even though like if you were going to be like, well, if you just look at it, yeah, like, yeah, why not shoot the big boy? You shot it just as good. Yeah, and I think or there's, better. There's there's room for that argument though too, right? So like, if you can handle it, maybe you should shoot the ten. Maybe you should get the ten, and and we can we can theory this to death, I suppose. And Mark, you made a really good point. I I don't know if we're jumping ahead, but just to like talk about which one to pick. The one that you're going to shoot the most often, the one that's not going to labor your wallet um, or labor your wrist into, you know, failure, is the one you're going to be best with. And I think you can do that better with the 9. Just because the cost of ammunition, the availability of ammunition, the variety of ammunition that you can get, the ease of use... The, the different applications in which this thing's an appropriate tool. Like if you're going to go pick up a, you know, a weekly USPSA league and, you know, practice moving and grooving with your pistol, the nine is going to be your answer. You like, could you Also could, not a bad idea. Yeah. If you're going to be carrying a pistol into bear country. Yeah. To, you know, be, again, you're creating a high pressure scenario. There's a time, compl- you know, there's all those things that come into play. I, I worry for myself, like knowing me, if I bought a 10 millimeter, like, I, remove the fact that I've used a pistol a fair amount. If I bought a 10 millimeter, I'd be like, okay, cool, I've got a bear gun. And it would, like, live in my safe. Like, when you're going to the range, tough to reach for that one. Yeah, like, correct. Oh, yeah, let's do some of this. And and I guess maybe we're overplaying it, too, because yeah. I also didn't find the recoil to be so much that it was like, oh. This is this is so uncomfortable. You know, like it wasn't to that degree. It, it wasn't, but it's definitely there. It's not one that you go out and casually recu- recreate with. Not that load. You can get other loads that would be a far bit more gentle. Well, and I think that's something to talk about too. Is uh, make sure at least to an extent you familiarize yourself with what you're going to be shooting out yeah. of the pistol. You know. Hopefully not, but you know, in you know, in a situation like, um, you know, a, a, a big bear encounter or any sort of defensive yeah. thing, uh, because you might get lulled into like, oh, this is how this pistol shoots with my practice rounds, and then, yep. you know, when when everything's happening, you're like, oh, it's a little little bit more, a little bit different. I don't know. Um, with that too, uh. And again, this is kind of like a subjective or like an observation. We've got some slow-mo footage of shooting both of these pistols. And actually, we have a lot of footage. And one thing that I would like to analyze, which we haven't done yet, you were talking a little bit about the recoil impulse. Yeah. um, And how I think potentially like the 10 was a little bit more up and down methodical. Yeah, there was like a linear aspect to it that... As I was shooting, and I only uh, only arrived at this watching the dot and the screen, and so this was fun for me because it was a it was a new thing because I really kind of go out of my way to not shoot red dots on pistols because I'm a stubborn slug. Um, with the ten, while we were doing the speed drills, I was watching the dot move up the screen, come back down, in almost like a perfectly straight line. And I'm, I'm trying to execute like a 0.3 split on this. Not, mm-hmm. I guess not consciously, but I always try to keep like a steady cadence on my trigger pulls. And, and within reason, like, do I see the dot? Is the dot on target? Can I execute the shot? Pull the trigger. Watching the dot on the 10, it was like a vertical presentation of the dot. Every single time, boom, dot disappears, dot comes back. Boom, dot disappears, dot comes back. With the 9, and, and I don't know if it was me 
maybe trying to overrun the pistol, over grip the pistol, or just the recoil characteristic of that individual load on that individual gun. It definitely seemed like it had a, almost a, 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 like a rotation in the torque. Like the dot would leave the screen at an angle and then return on the opposing side. And then I'd have to manage that coming through the recoil sequence, reacquire and, and execute. And I think, I think that's why my groups weren't as good. On target, for the most part, I had a couple of whoopsies, but I shot the 10 better. And I think that that recoil impulse, there was something there that was different. It's something that I wanted to bring up and talk about, but it's also something I want to investigate a little bit further. And really, yeah, really hard to crack because we're trying to like analyze something that occurred within three tenths of a second. Right. And, and like your eye and your brain like processing like, oh yeah, there's the dots up there. Okay, bam. A lot of variables at play there. Yeah. Including some of the stuff that we talked about before. Like, oh, well maybe I'm seeing some of that uh, personally because I'm not gripping uh, uh, the nine with as much intentionality. Sure. Therefore, that's, you know what I mean? So. You know what we should have done? We should have put some plate racks down there. Plate rack will always tell you. Plate rack never lies. Might have to do a little. We'll follow up, yeah. Uh, practice just to ferret out some of these questions that that we still have. Um, I think we've hammered this part to death. Yeah, I think you're right. It's um, just it's it's a lot to think. About. It is. It is. There's a lot of questions uh, that I had answered, um, and then a lot more that I left with. I guess that I never thought I'd leave with. But shall we get to the forty inch gel blocks plural? Yeah. Um. So uh, we shot the 10 first yep. at a 40-inch gel block, yep. uh, passed through with vigor. Yeah, showed very little sign of slowing down. Uh, did the same thing with the 9. Yep. Same result. <laughs> yes. Uh, which I, I would say I was a little bit surprised by. Also, I was impressed by it. And it's if I was going to pick what I wanted to see, that's exactly what I wanted to see yep. for this load, the intended application, and and what they're supposed to be doing. We put uh, another gel block behind that one. So now we have 80 inches of gel to go through. And uh, we got a lot of penetration into that second gel block uh, with both the 9 and the 10, but we're able, we're able to capture the projectiles. Yes. Curiously, at nearly the exact same distance of penetration. Right. And um, so I don't know that that necessarily puts a fork in anything and says like, well, they're exactly the same because they're not, right? We, we know definitively that the 10 is, is bringing more to the table in both frontal area, energy on target, muzzle velocity, all of that equates to a better terminal package overall, right? Um, but we ended up with like 69 inches of penetration out of both of them. Yeah. Pl- plus minus like a half an inch. Yeah, and then I'd say, you know, we did like we did a little bit of practicing, not practicing, we did kind of like a dry run. Oh, yeah. This is a little bit more of a production yep. than we usually have the, the day before. I'd say there was a couple times where we saw maybe um, slightly less penetration with the 9 versus the 10, but also not like crazy notable. Nope. It, um, it, and we're going to chalk that up to probably like ammunition variants, like a few feet per second here or there. Right. Or like variants in the gel block. And I think, you know, in all these tests that we've done, Limited data or, or sample set, right? So yeah. if we shot 100 blocks, we'd probably end up with 100 different results. We'd be able to come up with a more consistent and better average. But, right. you know, by and large, I'd say the the 10 performed to my expectation, the 9 exceeded the expectation that I, I think had. that's. I guess that's where I'd be as well. Yeah. yeah. It, it got very interesting when we incorporated the old bear head. Yes. Um, and so... As Mark had alluded, we kind of did a dry run first because we didn't know what we didn't know to see what would happen. And um, I'm sure they'll stitch in some of that footage Yeah, where we did that. Uh, in both cases, 9 and 10, we saw kind of what we were hoping for, bone deflection or, or like projectile course deflection because of bone. Mm-hmm. And this isn't green bone. Like this isn't real bone. It's a... a a medium similar to the density of regular bone, but it's not real bone. Right. Bullets do wild things when they encounter 
variable surfaces and densities and all these things. Um, most notably, we had a 10 millimeter enter the bear skull, struck it, what we'll call the forehead, exited nearly perpendicular out the ear. Out the ear. Yep. yep. And that was one of the coolest things that, that I've gotten to be a part of and witness. Um, in, in both cartridges, we captured bullets within the head. Mm-hmm. And in both cartridges, we had full pass-throughs. Mm-hmm. Um, even even targeting the same spots on the skull. So we were taking for granted that the production of this this skull replica here is consistent, which I think it is based on what we were seeing. Um, the individual bullet or projectile going through it had a, a variable result. Most of the time we saw s- some deviation, of course, pretty straight tracking like in the scheme of things, mm-hmm. but some deviation, of course, um, and exits. When, when we were doing the five rounds per skull thing, both cartridges... We had four exits, one capture. Right. Both captures were past the skull just before or at the vertebrae. Um, really wild how I think well the nine did, considering. I, I, I'm i not going to say I didn't have high hopes for it. I didn't think it was going to do that good. <laughs> like punch through. Yeah. Uh, and and no surprise at the amount of trauma that the 10 introduced. Because uh, it's a, I mean, that's a 40 caliber projectile, big flat nose on it, 1,200 feet per second. So that's, and the bear skull head representation that we have here has a single 10 millimeter hole uh, to the, you know, the slope of the forehead there. Yep. Uh, man, straight line penetration, essentially yep. right through the back, carried some bone with it, and and, and out it went. Yeah. So. And, uh, gosh, that was wild. Yeah, that was, uh, that was pretty neat to see and i'd say encouraging right yeah yeah i think so and and what watching that watching I, I think for me watching the nine perform at the level it did relative to the 10 I, i'm i'm confident in that choice that you made when you went to alaska like it would have been adequate yeah i mean i'd say like there, there's no you know i'm not gonna get to my uh kind of some of my conclusions i think even though we've alluded to some of that should we pull the gel uh the the projectiles from the fort well this is at um 69 inches of penetration yeah should we pull them? yeah let's uh, let's get them out i want to weigh these things i think you know what i think we're going to end up with mark i think we're very close to 100 percent weight retention let's flip this block eh? let's just turn it on its side real quick Now we've mentioned it before, but you know these these bullets are not designed to necessarily uh, they're they're not designed to expand. I mean they're designed to stay together no matter what they hit along their uh, their bullet path their 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 journey into whatever median uh, medium you uh, you put them into. Uh, you know their their goal is to stay together and and drive. I'll let you look at that. Oh, got him. I mean, there's a there's a significant difference between, you know, uh, as as should be expected. But you know, we've talked about the numbers, but the uh, the visual. And even like uh, you know, you feel these in your hands. I mean, that's uh. You know what they look like though? They look like you could put them back in a pistol and shoot them. Darn here. Yeah. Hard cast lead. Yeah. So let's should we put them up? Yeah. There? Throw the throw the nine up there. You want to throw the nine up there? Okay. What's your uh, prediction? Uh, we lost Starting the... weight one forty seven. Here's the thing with casting. You can see probably a little variance, maybe. And mm-hmm. there's a grease ring on there, and that grease is kind of dense. I'm going to go with one. Yeah, you see back here, the little cavitation? Oh, wild. Yeah. Um, uh-huh. Yeah, and then that one. Yep. I'm going to go with uh, one, 143. Wait, 143 from 147? Yeah. I'm going to go with one. Okay, I was going to go with one. I'm going to go with 140. Five. Okay. Mark, 145.7. There we go. Cool. 
Uh, and yeah, like 0, 0.0 deflection. And I, I guess I wouldn't anticipate we'd see much deflection going through Jello. Like I, I wouldn't, but yeah. um, also like exactly what you want to see at the same time. Correct. You know. Um, okay, this is the 220 grain. Yep. 10 millimeter projectile. Yep. What is your prediction on this? Let me get a size 218. 219.5. Throw it on. 219 there. even. You should have gone with Oh, 0.5. I should have gone with the 219.4. <laughs> Darn it. Um, and again, same thing. Looks exactly as it did when it left the cartridge. We do have this one on the table. So this one got punched through a skull. And this is the one that actually exited the head perpendicular, more or less. Went through a fair amount of the skull. Yeah. And but, then- but like basically... The whole of the bridge of the nose, the cranial cavity, and then shot out at about the ear. Mm-hmm. Um, which again, this is <clears throat> this this should go to reflect like the er- erratic behavior of projectiles when they encounter varying densities of tissue or obstacle. Um, there is you can see the face of the bullet's got that a little bit of a yeah deformity there. I surmise. I surmise. That that is the angle of attack that it had on the skull when yeah. it hit it. Yep. So we're we're seeing the bridge of the nose reshape the nose of the bullet, which, with that subtle deformation, is li- that's likely to why that bullet didn't change course. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And two seventeen. Yeah. So, and I'd say, like you said, Ryan, we shot both the nine and ten. Yep. Five rounds. Yep. Into other you know bear heads if you will uh and i'd say more often than not like very we didn't capture every projectile or find or recover but um a lot of them man they looked like they just straight line yeah yeah the whole way um this was a cool one it was it was super neat it was super neat i'm excited to actually get one of these skulls out of here um (laughs) just so we can have it yeah, they've got some. Uh, this is a very uh, clean. Yeah. One. Some of the others are are much less so. Yeah. A lot uh, of fracturing. A lot of fracturing. Some leakage. Yep. Um, got a little drip right over here. Oh, are we getting some? Yeah, it's not blood though. I don't know what that is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, th- I think we might uh, try and. At some point, in a, a very controlled and uh, tarped out environment, think of the car wash. Uh, yeah, uh, recover. You know, a couple of the projectiles that we did capture, yeah, as well as uh, you know, clean these up and hopefully end up with a, a new decoration for the. Oh, I uh, think that's going to studio. Look, I think that's going to look tops. So, Mark, you were talking about conclusions. Your your theories is it too soon for that? No, I think we're there. I, there, were, I think we've covered everything that we want to do. I I would say um, throughout this process, one thing, and I guess this can be definitely part of my conclusion. Um, practice, man. Yeah, shooting shooting a pistol is hard. Yeah. Shooting a pistol well is hard. Under and under some sort of duress. Under some sort of duress. And I would say even in general, um, a lot of folks, un- unless you've actually had some training, you're probably not shooting a pistol, uh, I guess, as correct as you could with, oh, yeah. with some good training. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and this is not, uh, I guess, maybe it is a shameless plug, whatever you want to call it, but um, the stuff that I've done with the guys down at Vortex Edge has dramatically uh, improved m- just my general ability, which I'd say is still you know, mediocre at best, but man, I'd hate to think of where I would be without it. Sure. Yeah, I, and I, I echo a, a lot of those sentiments. I'll say this: like, <clears throat> I still don't know that nine or ten is the best answer for bear defense because I, I just don't know. Um, it seems that both would show some 
serious promise. My my inclination with the right bullet. Yeah, my inclination as a shooter is that something is better than nothing. And if you if you are going to do this, like the the pack exercise is a really good thing. So I'd never thrown that holster on that pack. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you right now, it rode a little high for my preference, the way that it was set up. You wear your hip belt a little lower than I do. I was going to say, is that some of the difference of our body types and how we carry a pack, though? Absolutely, it is. And and so there's like an amendment to be made there. As with anything, if if this is something you're thinking about doing, mock it up ahead of time. Mount your pistol to your pack and don't do it the night before you pack it in a way to, to go get on a float plane and end up somewhere or end up in the back country. Um, moving forward with this, I will be going through a couple of iterations personally to figure out which holster that Rasco has a, a very strong chance of ending up there. I love the retention style, the way that they did it. I love the lines of the holster. It's very clean. It's very secure. It's light. Yeah. Um, definitely going with a QLS upgrade on the back end of it, just so that I can swap it between, you know, personal belt and, and hip belt on my pack. But figure out how it works and how you interact with it and how it's going to uh, sit there. And it's not a bad idea to seriously throw a salt bag in the back of your pack, go to the range, and just practice your draws. Um, with respect to which cartridge, though, and this is, this is tough. I think a lot of people are going to have a lot of things to say about this. Again, I think something is better than nothing. And if you can handle more, probably probably trust your gut on that, right? If, if the 10 is not uncomfortable for you to shoot and it doesn't burden your wallet um, to practice with, why wouldn't it be the better choice, right? Yeah. Like, I, I can't argue that. I think, I think you're probably more likely to find other things to do with a nine millimeter that are going to make you better with it. And I think we talk about this, like every time we talk about cartridges is like the one you can shoot the most and the best is the best one to run. And, and I I still lean very heavy in favor of nine millimeter just because of the, the amount of time that you can get behind it in practice um, and, and in, in other forms of recreation and it becoming a very meaningful tool in your arsenal. But if you can drive the 10, oh, yeah. Right. Why, why wouldn't you? It's like a no-brainer. Yeah. Like, yeah. If you, like, why wouldn't you? If you're like a, if you shoot that pistol well, yep. if you're used to it, if you've practiced with it, yep. uh, if you've shot a lot of pistol in your life, yep. and making that transition over is like, oh, dude, easy peasy, no big deal. My goodness, I'll take the horsepower every I'm, day of the week. On that, I want to make a note on these two pistols specifically. So these are Smith & Wesson M&P 2.0s as Mark could talk to. And I am generally not an M&P guy. Not because they're not great pistols, because they really are, but because I'm a Glock guy. And you know how us Glock guys are. Smith & Wesson did a really, really, really good job with these in respective calibers. And what I think is neat is <clears throat> if I obscure the caliber designation to the casual passerby. It'd be very hard to tell which one's a 9 and which one's a 10. Mm -hmm. In the hand, they don't feel significantly different. No. And the Smith has these really cool modular back straps that you can kind of curtail the fit to or or tailor the fit to, rather. You know, okay, please talk about that a little bit further. Sure. Because I actually did that with these pistols. Yeah. I was very inclined to go with the one, hey, this is the one that it came with. Uh, that's like, you know, probably like a nice average. Um, yep. So you ended up switching them out, uh, and I thought it filled out the hand uh, considerably better yep. and differently. Yep. So you can, you can tailor the fit of the grip modules or the panels on the rear of the pistol to make them fit a particular way. And I'll tell you what, right now, tell me the difference between, well, here, hold on. Somebody's going to say something about this. Candy, two pistols with slides open. There's no ammo in them. Tell me the difference between those two guns in the hand. And I've got a point to all this while I'm talking. 
I'm, I'm going to speak in favor of the 10 because it does have more power and more power is better, generally. If, if you were somebody who already had an M&P 2.0 or a regular M&P in 9 and you wanted an analog that was nearly identical only it offered you more horsepower, because they feel nearly identical in the hand, your muscle memory is the same, your grip placement and, and grab points the same, the the relationship between the center of the trigger shoe and where your hand indexes on it and your trigger finger pulls it is the same. Here's a case for having a quote unquote bear defense gun. You can get very practiced with your nine millimeter and do some practice with your ten millimeter, and because they're basically synonymous systems, yeah, you're not really losing much. Kind of like that one variable is changing. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, you're gonna have more recoil to contend with, but you can learn to kind of deal with that. Whereas, so as a Glock guy, like my opportunity is I, I carry a 43X, I shoot competitively a 34 or 17L. To go to a 20, which is the 10 millimeter version of the Glock, is a substantially chunkier pistol. Like I can feel it in the hand. And they have the 20SF, which is a, a, a cropped version of this, but it's different. It's different enough that in the hand I can tell, oh yeah, I've got a Glock large frame in my hand. Like, like either a 45 or a 10. You, you can feel it in the hand. It's a different grip. I'm getting a little nitpicky there. The M&P, because of the modularity and the way that they structured their grip, it's very clever. And you can make a large frame pistol like the 10 fit a small frame hand um, or fit as identically as possible to your 9 millimeter version. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, we talk about this with precision rifles, especially like guys will have a, a match gun that's chambered in... You know, six dash or six creed, six five creed, and then they'll build a trainer, identical rifle in two twenty three, even twenty two LR. Right. They get the same points of touch and points of contact on the rifle. All the muscle memory remains the same, only they have a more economical cartridge to shoot in practice and in volume. And and here's the case for two pistols, nine and ten. One's for recreating and competitive shooting. One's for serious bear medicine. Um, I'm not saying. Don't practice with the 10. It's, right. It's a very very clever way to do it. You know, that is, and I mean, it does fall under my general principle of m- more guns is always yeah. better. No, I'm not going to second that. Uh, you know, one thing I've been thinking about a little bit lately, Ryan, and, and this is part of my conclusion, uh, like we said before, full ad- full admission. Yeah. Never been in the scenario that we're, you know, trying to talk about today. Never sure. been in a bear charge, bear attack. Knock on wood. I've had, I have this nice wood table in front of me. Um, I would hypothesize that if it starts getting real nasty, there's a, a, a potential, whether early on in the scenario or down the road, uh, for the need of one hand operation. Sure. Right? Um, in that event, it is firing a 10 One versus handed. the 9, yeah. something we didn't do during this That's test. That's a good point. Uh, are you going to be able to control and hold and just physically hold on to the 9 a lot easier? And, and I'm thinking of a situation where maybe it's happening so fast that just getting the – you've gotten the pistol out, getting your support hand on – it's – it's tough. You're not going to get there. Yeah, maybe your other hand is up in defense because maybe that bear's it's up, bearing down on you. Maybe it's up in defense. Yep. Maybe you've been knocked down. Yep. And you've got, you know, your your other your. In this case, I'm showing my left hand. Uh, it's uh, it's indisposed. Plausible. Yeah. Maybe it's in the jaws of a bear. Maybe a bear's standing. I don't know. Right. Um, yeah. You. you and maybe in that situation, like uh, Mother Nature, your fight or flight response is taking over, and you could hold on to a freight train. I don't know, right? I agree. I 100 percent agree. And you could analyze that to death, and you can come up with a million different ways to be like, but if this, then that. And I think you know this topic comes up a lot on the internet. Yeah. Well, right. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of it is like, well, I think, or well, if this, or you know. A, a lot of uh, hypotheticals, I think, you know, no, nothing concrete. And, and I don't think we've concretely answered this question no. here today. I don't know that you can. I think we've done some, um, throughout this process, we have more data to work with. Sure. Uh, and some things to look at and consider. 
Yeah, what what I can draw from this is that the nine millimeter overperformed. I think um, my expectations or exceeded my expectations. Mm-hmm. The 10 millimeter did about what I thought a 10 millimeter was going to do with a 220 grain hard cast bullet. Mm-hmm. It was going to plow through things. It was going to have a general disregard for whatever it was plowing through. It was going to be more of a handful to shoot. Um, delighted to know that the nine did as good as it did. Right. I think um, I would I would personally feel adequately equipped with either on my hip. I I wouldn't tell you that one is lacking and one is overkill right right um i give bonus points to the nine millimeter for being a bit more controllable two extra rounds in the magazine and commonly found i give bonus points for the 10 millimeter for just being a 10 millimeter yeah i mean that's there's there's something to be said for that yeah i i concur with that entire evaluation you know uh like we said early on you know at the end of the day neither is uh you know from you know you compare it to like a, a 300 windman yeah. or something like that they're, they're not that but they are certainly going to be uh better than better than nothing and two of the more popular options that we see folks uh packing into into the bear woods and uh i think you really hit <laughs> What would you pick? If you maybe pick just because of, you know, all the things that we've talked about and, and what I know I'm more likely to practice with, and because the nine exceeded my expectations, mm-hmm. I'm probably gonna go I would I would probably <laughs> I would probably I was leaning towards the nine. Yeah. Uh but w- what you talked about with the two pistol option mm-hmm. of essentially, hey, I'm going to buy, by and large, two identical pistols. Yeah. I'm going to practice a lot with one. I'll still practice, but not as much with the other. And then if I got to a point where I was like, man, I really like how I'm shooting this pistol. I'm confident in how I shoot this pistol. Dude, I, I, I would carry the 10. Why not have more horsepower? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and especially in th- this pistol format. We have a Glock 20 and a Glock 40 down in the range. That is a little bit more buttoned up in the 10 package. Yeah, mm-hmm. from just like a, a size perspective and things like that. What if that I what just talking? what if I just said you can only have one mark? What would you pick? Uh, I do really want to point out just the the customizable grip thing because okay. I think that I think that does make a big difference. Now I think. Clock has something similar to that. They do, has. yeah. the The pistol doesn't end up as felt. Um, the MMP really does. Yeah, I don't. Know. I just, I, just, I really, li- I, I liked and appreciated that element more than I thought I would. Sure. Um, I can pick one. Yeah. I can pick one. Yeah. Then I'm probably going to pick the nine because okay. I'm going to want to practice with it a lot. I feel a little bit better now because I think that's ultimately where I went in my own head as well. Well, that's where I was going until you told me I could have two. Well, rounds on target, man. If if you can put them on target faster, and our splits both were faster with the nine, mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. think we could we could do a better job of being diligent with accuracy and all that kind of thing. And that's a practice issue. I I think if if we run this race out a hundred iterations, we end up being a bit more effective with the nine. I'm going to say something. Go ahead. Uh, I'm going to end with uh, a little uh, optics plug. Oh, sure. I know. We rarely do this. I know it. Uh, had we not had the Defender STs on here, yeah, m- I guarantee, guarantee my rounds on target uh, percentage yeah. would be grotesquely different sure. toward the negative. Sure. That, for me personally, was an absolute game changer. Sure. I will say I saw the same. I, I think... Um, Especially on the 10. When I saw that dot, I'm playing it back in my mind right now. It's like, because I was, I was lukewarm on that. I thought, golly, would I put one of these on my bear defense gun? And then watching that dot Gosh, move and group. So, like, ah, it's an I anxiety get, thing. Get, it's 100% an I get anxiety thing. In my ways too. But, the, like, it's funny. Like, for me, shooting a pistol. Hand me one of the things. It's it that's like it's, this is the way for me. It's solely an anxiety thing. 
And, you know, you did a, a really cool podcast with uh, Maxwell. Mm-hmm. And we, a thing on the ST, um, an intentional design element was the notch cut oh. just above the elevation turret. Mm-hmm. And so, like, uh, the curmudgeon old me that says, you know, iron sights never fail. Um, I'm looking at that notch cut right now and be like, usable sight picture. Here's another thing. Likelihood of being able to see your sights in the first place while doing this, pretty slim. Okay. Like when, when you're going to town uh, as fast as you can drive a pistol, and again, never been charged by bear. Possibly trying to get out of the way yeah. in some fashion. Yep. Uh, retreating to get behind an, uh, uh, some sort of barrier in some fashion. You, you made a, 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 a statement to me while we were filming this. You bracketed the target in the hood. I, that was your that was your point of reference. Was you you had the hood of the site to put your target into? There were because of the 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 time constraints and like some of the paper scenarios that we did because it was moving, uh, and you're trying to you know essentially stop this threat before it gets to you or you know uh, or in the one scenario like you know we had it set up so like you were shooting it almost like. Uh, like you were trying to prevent the bear from getting to you yeah. from like a more, I guess, a horizontal m- mover perspective. Yep. Uh, I was able to, through the hood, like I guess I, I described it as using it as like a, almost like a big a, giant peep sight. A big giant peep sight. I could see my sight picture. Uh, there was there was a couple shots where I do. Did I know it was a safe shot? Yes. Did I know that I had the paper bracketed within the housing of the sight? Yes. Had I acquired the dot because of drawing the pistol, uh, you know, building my grip and also like trying to get rounds on target uh, in an expeditious manner? No, I, I, there were shots that I let go that I knew were, were responsible, safe shots. Sure. But I had not acquired the dot yet. Those, uh, my uh, bullets still impacted by and large, uh, you know, somewhere uh, on, on the bear target. Yep. I'm and, sold on and it. And I like that. I'm sold on the system. Um, it's pretty cool. We've talked about it in uh, in other podcasts too, but you're also... Talk about a scenario where you're not going to be focused on your sights. You know, yeah. I'm talking specifically the irons. If you're like, oh, front sight, front sight, front sight. Like, it does allow you to stay target focused, threat focused yep. with the dot. Yep. And I think that's incredibly important in this situation. I agree. I think this is a very clever... Pairing. Is that the end of it? Big shout out to that Buffalo Bore ammo, man. That stuff's pretty wild. 69 inches of penetration through ballistics gelatin. Performed as advertised. My stars. Yeah, that was a fun one, Mark. You know, I think uh, ultimately, and we've said it a couple times, the decision is up to you. Yes. You know, we're, we're doing these things purely as an exercise to, you know, satiate our own curiosity, satiate our curi- curiosity, <laughs> yeah. uh, maybe, you know, uh, build or enhance confidence, you know, hopefully make a more informed decision. Yep. Um, you know, hopefully we have some additional data points here throughout this process. Um, to do that, every situation is going to be different. Uh, there's just so many variables at play. Uh, but yeah, like I said, the decision's up to you and, and it's, and it's a very personal decision and, and there's so many variables that go into making that decision that it's just, uh, it's going to be possibly different for everybody. Practice. When we were sighting these pistols in and I was doing a little bit of shooting, Pete said something that stuck with me, you know, cause we're talking about nine versus 10 and he said, always bet on skill. Yep. That's like, true. Always bet on skill. You know what I love about Pete? He's a pistol instructor. He's also a carbine and long range instructor as well but uh, Pete I think Wesley Snipes would say that a little bit differently sure Pete says all pistols suck and he's not wrong we're uh this might this is uh this is our Wisconsin goodbye here yeah but I think that plays into what we're talking about like you know nine versus ten what's better well one maybe maybe in some ways we've come up with what's better better but like Neither are great. No. I mean, he talks about many, many scenarios where yeah. people get shot multiple times with a pistol. Yeah. Nine, maybe 10. I think nine's probably more common. Yep. Uh, they walk into the hospital under their own power, right? Um, 
he mentioned one scenario where a person got shot in the forehead yeah with a 45 yep i don't know the you know uh the specifics yep but it essentially uh and i don't know the bullet you know whatever but i guess it was a 45 and it uh followed the skull yep essentially unzipped the uh the scalp the scalp yep and uh ended, ended up riding the top over the back of the head yeah they yeah. uh sewed the guy up and booked him the next day <laughs> yeah. like so now again we don't know the bullet we don't yeah, know yeah, everything yeah. right so yeah. all that's going to be different but i guess it just goes to show like yes something is better than nothing uh, boy, avoidance is probably, but but they're hey, just. This is for the situation that was unavoidable. Yes, if, you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna recreate in Big Bear Country, some situations are just gonna be uh, unavoidable at the end of the day. Agreed. So there we that. have it. All right. Well, thanks everybody for listening. Yeah. Like we said earlier, this this was uh this was a f- uh, extremely fun and, and for me informative uh, journey into this topic uh appreciate you listening appreciate you watching if you're listening to this and you haven't watched i suggest you watch because it's a gonna be a it is a very dynamic video um hopefully we've helped answer your question i'd be curious after watching this what is your answer to that question i think it's like i said earlier it's just gonna be personal for everybody um your safety is up to you hopefully enjoyed this uh man any, anything else from you, Ryan? Practice. Practice. Yep. If you're going to carry a pistol? Practice. Practice. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll catch you on the next one. See ya. Bye. There you have it, folks. Thank you very much for listening. As usual, give this video a like if you liked it. Comment something below and give us a subscribe to the Vortex Nation podcast channel. It would mean a lot to us. Also, why don't you give us a follow over on Instagram while you're at it, at Vortex Nation Podcast. We'd love to hear from you over there, and we'll keep you updated with all kinds of cool photos and videos from our adventures that we do here. Otherwise, we will see you on the next one. Thank you again. Happy hunting and shooting, everybody. Have a good one.